Thy word is strength. Thy word is power. God, your word is force. And your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light. Unto my well, hi, I want to welcome you to our Bible study here at Bible Talk. It's a blessing for you to be able to join with us, for us to be together with you across the internet. Whether you're watching as we do this live on Friday night, or even by the miracle of technology if you're watching at another time. Uh, we do posts, post all of the Bible studies in this series on our Bible Talk website. So if you want to go back and review this or have somebody else watch it, it's there to be used at your convenience. Okay? Uh, we're continuing in our study of Paul's first letter to the church of Thessalonica, the first, Thessaloni first Thessalonians. Mm -hmm. I'm being signaled here by my lovely wife, Alice. I'm not quite sure. I have not a clue what I'm she's trying to wave because I know they're waving to us. Hi. And I told them to wave. <laughs> so we're waving. <laughs> Well, this should be a good, strong Bible study, since the joy of the Lord is our strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And since you're so joyful, why don't you start us off this evening with a prayer? Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we do praise you and thank you for allowing us to, to get together, to, to study and to share your word and the technology that enables us to get it out into all the world. And we just praise you and thank you for the word that is growing in us and strengthening strengthening us and we just praise you and thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> it was Mark's fault. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> uh, well Sorry. we're in the second chapter of First Thessalonians and I'm gonna would it help if I zoomed in and get away from you? Here? Okay. All right. Okay. We left off last week uh, in in second in First Thessalonians. Okay. All right. Well, I'm done. I'm done. Okay. We left off in First Thessalonians chapter two. And we were up to, uh, we read verse 5. So I'm going to pick that up uh, in verse 6. Paul goes on to say, after, after he had said that God is witness to the fact that he wasn't doing what he did with flattering speech or for greed, then he goes on to say in verse 6, Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, even though as apostles of Christ we might have asserted our authority. Now, let me, let me go on. But we, we, we have proved to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. That's verse 7, right? Mm -hmm. So the first thing that Paul is saying is he wasn't seeking glory from men. That seems to be something we have to be on guard for. Uh, pride is so insidious. That we like the approval of man and we like glory from man. That's our flesh. But the fact of the matter is that's not God's desire in our life. Because he is the one who deserves all of the glory. And Jesus said this. Now let me, let me go back and read you something John the Baptist said. Because remember in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus said that John, nobody had a greater ministry up to that time until John the Baptist. And remember, John the Baptist said, you yourselves are, are witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He, meaning Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's in the Gospel of John, John chapter 3. So here, John the Baptist, he's, he's comparing himself to, you know, he's not the bridegroom. That's Jesus Christ, right? He is only there to point to Jesus Christ. And that is the purpose of every ministry. No matter what the ministry is, 
is always to point people to Jesus Christ, that he gets all of the honor and all of the glory, all right? Mm -hmm. But there is a law there. There is a spiritual law that is so true, and I know we've talked about it here before, but I, it, it doesn't hurt to say it again. You have to picture this. John said, I must decrease that he might increase, all right? Mm -hmm. There's that balance. And remember, it says in Proverbs 11 that an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. In ministry, in life, the more a person is exalted, the more a person goes up, the more Christ goes down. Would you say that this is the same type of thing that with the glass of water, where you just put a drop of poison in it, it's, you know, it's no good. So if you're in the scales, even if there's just the smidgen of you in there. Well, I understand what you're saying, because... It, you know, I just said for in Proverbs 11, it says an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I always use the example of a seesaw, a teeter-totter. And, you know, it's like one side goes up, the other goes down. What's a just balance? A just balance is none of us in all the hands. For we have died and our life is hidden in Christ Jesus. It's not supposed to be any of us. And the reason for that is pride. Well, that, that's... And it, pride, you know, pride is no good. No. Pride is no good. That, is that that's the truth. That's yeah. the truth. But pride is insidious. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always there, chipping away at you, trying to get in. But it says in Proverbs chapter 6 that there are six things that the Lord hates, yea, even seven are an abomination. And the very first one is haughty eyes, and that's pride. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's a gateway to all sin. That's it, like the gateway to all sin. So we have to watch. You know, it's, it feels so good to have people come up and, and pat you on the back and tell you what a great job you did and everything. And you know what? We're going to encourage one another. But the thing is, the glory has to go to the Lord. And you have to be very, very prayerful about this. Because it's easy to start getting to that place where you like to receive you that glory. You, you begin to look for it. And when you begin to look for it, then you change you your approach to people. And you change what you're saying because you're trying to please men rather than pleasing God. Which is what Paul has been talking about a lot here. Um, and, and it was typical of religious people in the time of Jesus Christ. I mean, this was a whole deal with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So, you know, they thought that Jesus was like them. People always think that you're like them. That's why evil people will always, they'll assume that you have the same evil in your heart that they do. Right? But Jesus said in John chapter 5, he said, I do not receive glory from men, but I know you that you do not have the love of God in yourselves, talking to the Pharisees, right? I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God? I mean, what you want to hear is, you want to hear the Lord saying, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. It, it may sound nice to have people say that to you, but the fact of the matter is, you want to hear that from the Lord. That's why Paul wrote to Timothy and said, study to show yourself approved unto God. It's got to be the Lord that you're always trying to please. And in the process of doing this, you're always pointing people to Jesus Christ. Whatever your, Like I said, whatever your ministry is, your purpose is to point people to Jesus Christ. But don't you think that it would be a good thing to um, incorporate what they did in the Roman times? And you've shared this before, where the young boy is there, but it doesn't have to be a young boy, just somebody there in your life that can constantly remind you that you're only just a man. I don't know. What Alice is talking about, it was, uh, and maybe you've seen this in old Roman movies, you know, when there was a conquering general who came back to Rome. And remember, he could not bring his army across the uh, Tiber River. Mm -hmm. But they would have, and if you've seen this in the movies, you see, you know, the entire city of Rome would turn out and they'd have this massive, masses, massive parade that came down and he would be honored by the Caesar. So he would ride a chariot with these white horses and going into up to the to the Caesar. But it was their practice to put a young boy in that chariot with him, saying to the conquering general the whole trip, you're only a man, you're only a man, reminding him of his humanity, okay? Because it's so easy for that pride to take over. Do we need somebody in our life like that? No. I don't, I don't think we should have to have somebody in our life because we're to encourage one another. The fact of the matter is what we ought to do is fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and perfecter of our faith. And as you stay fixed on Jesus Christ, you will always, rem you will always remember 
how you you know how I hate to use the term insignificant because you're precious in the sight of the Lord. But it's not because of anything you've done. It's because that's a gift of God that He has made you precious in His own sight. Okay? But it's it's what you don't want is people in your life who are constantly flattering. Okay, there's a difference between flattering and encouraging. Yes. And all too often flattery has a motive, an ulterior motive behind it. But that's a whole other story. So Paul in this verse also said that he could have uh, asserted his authority. <clears throat> and one of the things you have to understand is Paul had authority. Okay, and this is important. There is authority in the body of Christ. And this is something there's not a lot of teaching on. It. There's certainly not a lot of balanced or right teaching on in the church today. Because either it's thrown out or it's over overdone. And that authority is no balance. It's out of balance. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus, and we'll talk about this more, talked about that. He said, don't be called a leader, by the way, for there's one leader. And that is Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. It's like. We are not supposed to lord it over others. That's what he said that the, the unbelievers do. But if anybody would be great, yes, let him be the servant of them all. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that there's not authority. And there's one thing you have to understand about authority. And, you, and the world is trying to convince you otherwise with this. And this is the truth. Authority always flows from the top down. And it comes from the author. That's where the word comes from, the author. Who is the author? Of everything in existence. That's why it says in the Psalms that the earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. He created it. He owns it. He is the author of everything. Mm -hmm. So all authority flows from him down. And regardless of whether you accept this, believe it, or you know, understand it, it doesn't change the truth of the matter. I mean, Pontius Pilate didn't understand this. Mm -hmm. And when Christ was standing before Pontius Pilate on trial, you know, Pilate said to him, Don't you understand? I have the authority. I can I have the authority to put you to death. And Jesus said to him, you have no authority, except my Father gave it to you. All authority comes from God. And you do well to remember this. Now, I'm not a political guy, and I'm not a fan of most politicians, uh, because it's, it's just a world system. It's a game. But don't forget that we are to pray for those who are in authority, because God put them there. They have a ministry. They may not be fulfilling the ministry that God has called them to. But it's God who appoints the rulers. It's God who has their heart in the palm of his hand. Mm -hmm. And they serve his purpose. Whether it looks good or bad to you, it's, it's going to serve his purpose. All right? But Paul could have exist, exerted authority. And God would back him up. Yes. Now, if you don't believe this, and you don't, <clears throat> we, we've gotten far away from this. You know why? Because by nature, human nature, fallen human nature, we are a rebellious people. And all you have to do is look around in the world and you'll see rebellion everywhere you look, in every direction. You know, you can call it what you want. You can call it you can call it the, the Arab Spring. Is that what it is? The Arab Spring? Mm -hmm. Or you can call it the Wall Street thingy dingy, what's going on down there now. You can call it that, or you can call it a child who is disobedient to his parents. But it's a breach of authority, and all breaches of authority are rebellion. And God says that rebellion is his witchcraft. So we need to learn to be submitted to authority, all authority. And, and one of the things here, Paul talks about his ministry, preaching the gospel, which is he, he's been talking about here in his letter to, in his first letter to the Thessalonians, right? And he said, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason, I also suffer these things. We've talked a lot about that in this study so far. But I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. You see, we hear a lot of teaching, particularly you know, in charismatic and Pentecostal churches, about the anointing. Oh, you've got to have the anointing. Well, let me tell you, first of all, you've got to have the appointing. It's got to be the call of God in your life. right? Paul was appointed. And when God appoints you to something, what he's doing is he is giving you a task, better known as a minister. And when he gives you that task to do, he will equip you for that. And everybody that's been called to a ministry, which is everybody, has God's anointing to what he has appointed them to do. And uh, this anointing is not something, I don't, I don't get it. It's not something that comes and goes and flits around. You know, you have a, if God has given you authority, God has given you authority. 
The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. They're unrepentable. They don't come and go. They don't flow like the, the wind. They are there in a person's life. But Paul's desire was to be fulfilling what Jesus had said. He didn't want to lord it over anybody. He wanted to bless people. He wanted to serve. His ministry was a ministry of service. Remember, let me just read that verse to you. Jesus called his disciples to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's Matthew chapter 20. So Jesus, I mean, you know, by, by word and by example, continually taught that ministry is service. Then, then look at what he said here, okay? In verse 7, We prove to be gentle among you as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her own children. God had spoken to the prophet Isaiah and said, Can a woman forget her nursing child? That she should not have compassion on the son of her womb. Yes, even they may forget, yet I will not forget thee. What he's, what he's using, this is an example. I don't know of a better example, and God attests to that, of a heart of service, of giving. All right? The Lord uses that example because it's probably the best picture there is of a giving, nurturing relationship on earth. All right? A nursing mother has to be. She's totally giving and selfless, mm -hmm. providing the child with life-sustaining nourishment. Not on a, not on a schedule that's not convenient to her, right? No, no. But at, at the need of the child. Right. The spirit-inspired attitude is seen in Paul as he goes on to say, having so fond an affection for you, in verse 8, mm -hmm. right? We were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but all our own lives. So that's what we're supposed to be. I mean, this is what a discipleship relationship. And Jesus, that's the great commission in, in Matthew 28. When Jesus says, go out and make disciples. It's not somebody lording it over somebody else. And as I said, you got to remember this chain of authority. Paul, did Paul have disciples? Alice says yes. Weekly says yes this time. Come on. Yes. Okay. Would you call Timothy a disciple of Yes. I was going to have him as an example. Well, or Timothy, Titus. I mean, there's a lot of them, actually. However, one of the things is, and this is really important, is that what it says in Matthew 28 is that we're to go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the and teaching them the commandments of Jesus Christ and telling them to do the commandments of Jesus Christ. A true discipleship relationship in the, under the authority of God doesn't, doesn't create, it creates a relationship. Mm -hmm. Timothy and Paul had a relationship. But Paul was building a relationship between Timothy and Jesus Christ. His purpose is not to replace Jesus Christ in that relationship, but to point Timothy to Jesus Christ. And that's evident. I mean, read the, the two letters that Paul wrote to Timothy, and you'll see that. So we're, we're always, in our whatever we're doing, teachers are supposed to teach, but they're pointing people to Jesus Christ, getting the, to go. They're not replacing Jesus Christ. Or, or getting in the way. Getting in the way, which is very, very common. Because, you know, they, they would say authority is, you know, God, Jesus Christ, your pastor, and then you. And... To the, there are some churches that you have to go through the pastor to get through to Jesus. Well, that's that's and you had a you, that's you part have, of the definition of a cult, right, right? But you have to be taken as a leader. You have to be taken out of the way, and says you can have the same relationship too. It says in Hebrews that we're all supposed to have the same relationship. There is no chain of command. Be because we're all equal. Well, you got to be careful. I mean, there's, there's not a chain of command, but there is a chain, chain of, authority. of authority. There is a chain of authority. Or a chain of service. Well, but it is a chain it's of authority. authority. I mean, right. it, it is authority. That's why Paul said he could, he had the right to exercise that authority. 
People right? just and don't like did. the word authority. They don't like the word authority. Oh, I'm, I'm not challenging that. No, no, no. But there are people and who just Paul, don't like that. Paul, I don't know if he did this on purpose or he did what God wanted him to do, but he he was gun shot. He, he didn't, he chose not to exert his authority. A lot of that, times. That's not, that's not gun shy. That's not gun shy at all. That, that is a heart of, of a servant. I mean, it's not, it's not based on fear of something. It is based on trying to build that right relationship, not get in between in the relationship. That's why so often it upsets me, and I've said this to people. You know, I'll, I'll start talking about the Word of God, and people will say, well, so-and-so says, and so-and-so says, and so-and-so says. And, and, and with those people, I'll never hear them say, well, the Lord says. Well, a, a teacher is supposed to be building, nourishing, and nurturing that relationship between his disciples and Jesus Christ. Not to be building and making people dependent on him, but pointing them to their right relationship, their dependent relationship on the Lord. And so, someone matures in the Lord. That's where they get to that point, if that's what they're being taught. Well, that's one of the yeah one of the things here with with the Thessalonians that Paul is saying. Remember, I said that this is a fairly young church. All right, um, this this church that he is writing to here in the first letter is probably only been in existence for a couple of years. Well, that's not that's not they should have maturity by that time. Yeah. But it's still like Paul is looking to nurture them and see the growth going on in them. He'll talk about the growth that's already taken place, mm -hmm. but to see his desire is to see that ongoing and continuing growth. And by the way, you should have continuing growth in everybody's life. Mm -hmm. I mean, for the it's calling of God is an upward calling. I mean, you know, God is transforming us, bringing us from glory to glory. So that's a continuous, that growth is a continuous thing as long as you're here on the, on the planet. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, so, but, but again, that's a, a really good example, that, that nursing mother, because... This is somebody, the person who is, now the mother is an authority over the child. Yes. But when the baby starts crying at 2 o'clock in the morning, the mother doesn't sh holler out and say shut, shut up, up yeah. and just for better, forget about the kid. I mean, that's a, that would be an abuse of quote-unquote authority. Uh, that's right. Mm -hmm. But that mother is responsible. Authority response. is not lordship over. It is responsibility for. Okay. And Paul understood that really well. And that's that that's why I say he's not gun shy. He understood that his responsibility, he had been entrusted with the gospel, he had been entrusted with the care of these people. Mm -hmm. This is this is what a good shepherd does, and Christ is the example of that good shepherd. So he says, having so fond an affection for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives. I mean and by the way, I mean, how, how, do you, how do you give the gospel without giving of yourself? I, mean, I don't understand. I don't understand how you can possibly do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we may not see that as much as we should in the, in the church, the organized church today. But the fact is, how, how simple is it to see in the gospel that that pastor is supposed to be the servant of the body? Not, not, the, not the CEO who lords it over, but that's common. And it's not just common in our time. It was common when God spoke back to Ezekiel, saying, woe to the shepherds of Israel, you know, who feed themselves rather than feeding the flock. It's, it's the, I think, a common thing in the, in the church today, that if there's a congregate that needs the pastor, they have to go on the pastor's schedule. Well, of course. And it's not, like, if they have a need right now, they can't, just go to the pastor and... Well, um, may the Spirit of God change that. I mean, because it, this, this is, you know, the call of ministry is a call to die to yourself, deny yourself. It's, it's a call to serve. And that example that Paul gives, I mean, like I said, a nursing mother, the baby starts crying at 2 o'clock in the morning. Guess what? Mommy gets up and feeds the baby. You know, it's not on her schedule. It's not at her convenience. And that's the way Paul saw his ministry. Okay. So, I mean, he's giving his life. And he he's a... Conscious, very conscious of that. Why? Because you have become very dear to us. For you recall, brethren, our labor and hardship, how working night and day so not to be a burden to any of you, we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and so is God, how devoutly and uprightly and blamelessly we behave towards you believers. 
just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each one of you as a father with his own children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. So again, this is this is the example of Paul. Paul is not, yeah, but Paul is not only preaching this, he is absolutely living. And he's saying, you know, he doesn't, he's not, he's showing himself not to be a burden. I'm going to tell you, here's what the Word of God says. Here's what the Word of God, the, the God-breathed Word says. Paul said, be an imitator of me, even as I am of Christ. Mm -hmm. Here is a man who is giving his life. Mm -hmm. And this is supposed to be an example. Christ did the same thing. Now, if you say, well, that was Jesus. Well, then look at Paul. But the fact is, this is not what we see commonly in the church today. So may God deal with the heart of pastors and touch and bring them to that place well, they would have that heart of love to serve the people that God has entrusted them with. You know, he, he says he did this so he wouldn't be a burden. But by the way, it's not wrong for a preacher to receive funds for preaching. No. You know, here, here's, here's what Paul wrote in, in 1 Corinthians 9. He said, do you not know that those who perform sacred services eat the food of the temple? And those who attend regularly to the altar have their share from the altar. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. There's nothing wrong with that. But you listen, if, if you're not intelligent enough to know when that's being abused, well, I, I don't know what to say to you. I mean, because I see a lot of abuse today. There's, there's one thing to have your needs met. And that's kind of what God, what Jesus indicated through the gospels. When he sent them out and said, don't take a money bag, don't take more than two garments, go out. Because it, your needs will be met. Well, you got to, we're not very good at defining needs in this day and age. Not in our culture here in the West. I mean, you know, I hear people running around saying they need this and they need that. and they need. You know what you need? You need food and covering. And that's why the, Paul says, if we have food and covering with these, you shall be content. That's what you God need. Said you, would provide. you don't need a 97-inch television in every room of your house. You don't. That's not a need. You don't need, you know, well, listen, you know, I'm not going to tell you, you what know, you need. Know. I'm not, I'm not going to yeah. tell you what you need and what you don't need. But the Spirit of God will, if you'll be honest with yourself. And that's all I got to say about that. So he says that he has, that anybody who's preaching the gospel has the right to be supported by preaching and teaching that gospel. Mm -hmm. right? and, and that, by the way, is not just one verse. That is attested to by many verses in the New Testament. But then, he says, what then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge, so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win the more. This is the attitude of Jesus Christ. This is what Paul taught when he wrote to the Philippians. Remember, and before he was at Thessalonians, Thessalonica, he just come from Philippi. When he says, have the same attitude, the same mind in yourself that was in Christ Jesus, who emptied himself. This was voluntary. I mean, even if God hasn't called you to give up all, what Paul is saying is that's my desire. Why? Because what is important is not my my luxury, not my what's important is not my life. What's not important is not me. What's important is the ministry that Christ has entrusted me with. This to bring the word of God, that imperishable seed of the word that reconciles men to God the Father. That's what was important. Mm -hmm. So he's saying he made this choice because he would rather do this than give the devil an opportunity. He says, don't give the devil an opportunity. Paul was living the gospel. So let me give you another verse. Jesus called them to himself. This is the ruler, the disciples of him. And he said, great men exercise authority over them. It's not this way among you. Same thing. It's always this idea that you are called to serve. Jesus said, nobody can be my disciple unless he denies himself, picks up his own cross daily and follows me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, somehow we, we have Americanized the church and said, well, you know, if a pastor is a pastor of a big church. He's entitled to this. He's entitled to that. You know what he's entitled to? He's entitled to the same things. He's entitled to a life like Paul. 
He's entitled to a life like Jesus Christ. And if he thinks he's entitled to more than that, I wonder what gospel he's reading. And why does the size of the church uh, have anything to do with what he gets? I mean, well, because it's a corporation and they're running it like corporations. He's the CEO of it. And uh, this, this is it. Listen, I'm not, I don't want to spend hours. Yeah. But, you know, just, but the fact of the matter is, if, if you are a student of Jesus Christ and a student of the word of God, you should recognize the fact that that is not the lifestyle that God has called us to. The lifestyle that he has called us to is an imitation of Jesus Christ, an imitation of Paul, an imitation of Peter, an imitation of John and James and all of those saints who have gone on before us, where they were willing to give, give, give. Not They're not looking to receive, receive, receive. Why? Because there was one thing important to them in their lives, and that was the salvation, well-being, and growth of other, other Christians. That's all. It wasn't... They, they, they took it to heart when Jesus said, you know, store up your treasures in heaven. They weren't trying to get all the treasures here. They weren't trying to get the glory here. They weren't trying to get the honor here. They weren't trying, what they were looking for was to serve Jesus Christ. And Jesus never promised you that that would be an easy thing or that you'll be well rewarded here on this planet. He's well warned throughout the, the word what the rewards would be here. Yeah. We will get persecuted. Well, you don't hear you don't hear that preached and taught a lot though, and, and it's not like you should go out. You, you shouldn't have to go out looking for persecution. No, trust me on that. <laughs> persecution will will come find you. However, having said that, I want you to know this: if you're being faithful to God, that the blessings of God will find you, because when you're being obedient to the Word of God, it says in Deuteronomy 28 that if you hear His voice, you obey His Word, then the blessings of God will come upon you. They'll overtake you. They'll come upon you and overtake you. It will flat, they'll find you, whether you're in the city or in the country. God desires to bless you, but the, the blessings are not, you know, the newest, most modern, most expensive car. The blessings of God are to hear the voice of the bridegroom say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. What, what pleased, and I don't want to get ahead of myself here in the study, but you can see this. It says, Jesus, for the joy set before him, went to the cross. And Paul will say the same thing, basically. So it's not about the, what the world has to offer. You know, the, the greatest prosperity preacher I ever heard was the devil. Mm -hmm. When he That's told Jesus, hey, you can have it all. You can have it all. You know, That's where it began. You can have it all. all right. In verse 13, Paul goes on to say, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but for what it really is. The word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. Now, here's, let me just say this. Let's, first of all, we're talking about the word of God. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, all scripture. And that, by the way, starts at Genesis 1. He, you know, it's not, it's not just the letters in red, and it's not just from Matthew on. All scripture is God-breathed, is what it says. I know most of the versions say inspired or but the fact that that word inspired is theonustos. I may pronounce that wrong, but that's what it is, theonustos, which literally means God's breath. Okay? Ruach. Ruach. That's Hebrew, yes. Okay. So um, it, it literally comes from the mouth of God. It's inspired and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So... They're not giving credit to Paul for the word. They're, they're accepting it as God's word, all right? I want to read you what Peter said. This is from 2 Peter chapter 1. It says, but know this first of all, that no prophecy, and remember prophecy means speaking for God, okay? No prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Paul didn't make this stuff up. And Paul's not sitting around inventing this stuff. I mean, there are people today who would credit Paul with starting Christianity. You know, nobody started Christianity. Jesus came and just uh, fulfilled 
the, the, the law of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know, so they're doing the, the right thing here. Um, but it's God's word is God's word. And you need to be able to tell the difference between what men are saying, men's word and God's word. How can you do that? By knowing the word. By knowing the word. That, and that's the only way you'll know. I, you know, I mean, there's great debate as we sit here this evening because of the political situation in the United States. You know, there's, there's all this debate about cults that's going on in, in the, the political forum. Well, how can you tell what a cult is? And, and by the way, if you're interested in this, write to me. Write to me at office at BibleTalk.com because somewhere, a number of years ago, I did a study called Springs Without Water. And it's about 10 things that you can look at, criteria that define a cult. Right. All right? Mm -hmm. And I'd be happy to find that and send it to you. I know what it is. Well, Alice knows where it is. So we'd be more Sorry. than happy to send it to you. But the fact is, one of the things about a cult is that there's always something that, in fact, supersedes Scripture. That's right. Always. And that thing will always be a teaching of men. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, it's not anything new. Because Jesus said, when he said to the, to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and said, you know, that you nicely set aside the commandments of God to hold fast to your tradition. What was the tradition? He said, teaching as commandments of God the precepts of men. It was what men had to say rather than what God had to say. Now, a lot of the times that what man has to say is masquerading as another thing from God. Well, of course it will. That's what a cult does. It always, it always says it's from God. How can you tell? I mean, certainly the false prophet. And this is why, I mean, listen, this is why in New Testament, the, the John had to write and say, test the spirit for many false prophets are going abroad. This is why Jesus, talking about the last days in Matthew 24, warned against false prophets. Because a lot of people are going to come along and say, quote unquote, thus says the Lord. But it's not the word of God. It's the word of men. How can you tell? The first thing is, you have to know the Word of God so you can test it. You test it against the Word because God is not inconsistent. It's, you know, it's, he, he says in the Word, am I a man that I should change? He doesn't change. Jesus Christ, who is the Word, is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. You know, if it doesn't line up with the Word it, and it doesn't change the, the, the situation, it doesn't change because people's fashion style change. God's Word doesn't change, right? But you have to know God's word to be able to test it. I think in the beginning of Revelations it says, do, do not add to the word, and then do not subtract from it. It says it in a few places. Yes. Don't change the word. And, and quite frankly, I mean, there, there are some very, very faulty translations out there today. So what I see is a pattern for the first time, by the way. I mean, and this is in, speaking historically, I mean, this is in very recent times that people have the audacity to change the scriptures. Yes. Um, I mean, there are some horrible, horrible, quote-unquote, Bible translations out there that just do not say what God said. Okay? How can you tell? There's also, if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. Hopefully you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, and you should be have within you the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And there should be this, some discernment in there. I mean, when some people are talking, you know, and it's not the word of God, but the word of men, something should, I mean, the hair should stand up on the back of your neck and something should tingle and something should say, whoa, this doesn't sound right. What do you do? You go test it against the word. One of the things, too, that makes me think about what Paul had said about he doesn't come with flattering speech. And in Proverbs, it says, a man who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his steps. Yeah. So anybody mm -hmm. that's coming with flattering speech, there's always, yeah. There's no that's why I say there's no ul ulterior motives. Always, yeah. So, you know, God's word, and this is what Paul says, his word, God's word, performs its work in you who believe. Do you know that God's word has a purpose in your life? It says in Isaiah 55 that God's word doesn't go forth without accomplishing his purpose, right? How does God change you? With his word. With the inside out. How many tools, what does God use to do what he does? Did he use a, let me ask you this question. I'm being a little bit facetious. 
uses the potter's wheel. Okay, did he use a hammer and chisel to, to build the world? Did he use a carpenter's square to build the world? He spoke it. He spoke it into existence. That's it. How did he bring the birds and the sun, the moon, the stars into existence? What word. tool did he use? Spoke. The word. That's spoken right. into existence. The tool that God uses is the word. Right. Now, it's, I know it says in a number of places, like, you know, we are the work of his hands. Mm -hmm. Okay. God formed Adam with his hands. Mm -hmm. But when God formed Adam with his hands, you know, Adam was dead. Mm -hmm. He wasn't That's alive right. till God That's breathed right. into him. Theonustos. It takes the breath of God, it takes the word to bring life into a situation. Mm -hmm. So, God's purpose, well, I, I, I've preached this a, a number of times recently, is to change you. I mean, God desires to change you. It's not that he doesn't love you where you are, but he loves you enough to bring you someplace higher and higher, to make you, even though you are precious in his sight, even this moment where you are right now, his promise in your life is to bring you from glory to glory. Because the calling of God is an upward call. Upward to what? God has predestined you to become conformed into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. How is he doing that? He's doing it with his word. His word, which is sharper than any two-edged sword. You know what he's doing with this? This is the tool he uses, his word, to cut away from you the things that keep you from the fullness of life that he has. You know, I was just thinking about the uh, fact that he's creating a masterpiece. And I was thinking about master and peace, and then I was thinking about peace is like the remnant. It's just a, 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 a remnant. Peace. A peace left. And then you were saying he's cutting away, cutting away, and yeah. what he's... He's left with just like a remnant. Well, there, there is going to be a remnant. Yeah. Right? Yes. The, but the thing is, see, here's what it's, it says. Paul wrote um, in Philippians, in the first chapter of Philippians, and he said, For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus, saying until Jesus comes back, right? So God has begun this, this work in you. You didn't begin it. I mean, when you said yes to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, he began to work in you. He gave you new life. He called you out of the tomb into new life. He breathed into you the breath of life. You were saved by the imperishable seed of the word, Peter says. He did it with the same way he did with Adam. He breathed life into you with his word, right? So he began a good work, and Paul is saying that he is confident, he's assured that the work that God began in you God is going to complete you. God's going to finish. He's not going to leave you half done. So how does he do it? He only has that one tool. The one tool of life, his word. He formed man with his hands, but it was God's breath that gave Adam life. Now, think. listen to this verse. This is from Peter. He said, seeing that his divine nature, God, right? Seeing that his divine nature has granted to us Everything pertaining to life and godliness. That's in his word, right? Mm -hmm. Through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Right? So God in his word, this is where he gives us knowledge. Mm -hmm. This is where he gives us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Right. For by these, he has granted to us his precious and mag magnificent promises. Mm -hmm. So that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. God is using his word to bring the fullness of his divine nature into being in your life. So that's God performing his word, his works in you through his word. If you understand that and you get that, you got to think, am I really spending enough time in the Word? And when I say spending enough time in the Word, I'm not just talking about sitting and reading your Bible, which you need to be doing a lot. It says, you know, be diligent, Meditate. study to show yourself approved unto God. But it's, it's, it's more than that. It's meditating on the, the Word day and night. God doesn't expect you, you know, if you're a bus driver, to go to work during the day and sit there and, you know, steer with one hand and read with the other. He doesn't. But you can still be meditating. You can be chewing on that word. You can have that word richly dwelling within you as you're driving the bus with two hands. Okay? So you got to get in the habit of meditating on God's word, applying God's word, 
seeing how God's word works in every part of your situation in your daily life. It's like when we're feeding the flesh, you know, sit there and just take a, a hero and put the whole thing in our mouth and swallow it. Is that true? One of us is one. We chew it. We take bites of it. We chew it. We let it go in and and that's the way we should be doing oh, the word. Okay. And then your body digests it over a period of time. Yeah. And then, yes. Okay. No, that's true. Your spirit. spirit. Also, the application of it. Um, you see where uh, God wor God's word is true when 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 you start to apply it. And the more you see it come be, become true, right. the more you want to apply it, That's the right. more you get in to learn it. Exactly. Well, part of this has to do right. with believing the word again. That's it. Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, there are a lot of there are a lot of quote unquote believers out there. I often wonder what exactly they believe. Uh, we have a dear brother in the Lord who's a pastor over in Winter Park. His name is Robert Dunlop, and he sent out an email today, and he was awesome. talking about. Yeah. Um, healing scriptures. I was bring that up. Well, and, and there are so many verses in scripture Absolutely. that talk uh, that talk about yeah. and relate to healing. And he's saying, well, you know, these are, it's, it's like taking a prescription. It's like, you know, if you have if you have to take aspirin or take a drug or you know a, a prescription medicine, you'll do that faithfully. Mm -hmm. We should be taking the word of God that faithfully it's because like, you know it says in Proverbs that the word of God is healing to the whole body. So we should be taking these things. And reading these scriptures about healing, and then meditating on them, chewing on them. You know, it's not just a matter of reading it one time and letting it go. It's a matter of meditating on the Word of God. And it was somewhere, maybe it was Sunday we were talking, and I don't remember where it was, but it said, prescribe the Word. Yeah. yeah. It's a, you said it's a prescription. It's like yeah. a prescription. A prescri yeah. a prescription. Prescription, yes. Prescription. All right. So I'm going to go on to verse 14 through 16. I want to read that. Oh, can I just go back to the healing thing? Just for, um, I, when I, I read that today, with, um, Robert had sent out. And that is like one area in, in the, one of the areas in my life that I keep praying that, um, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And I really think that it's something that has to do, the healing has to do with your belief. Everything has to do with you. Yeah. Everything has to do with yeah. you. Yeah. But, yes. Uh, I mean, you know, Jesus said, be it done to you as you believe. But I, I don't know anybody. I mean, I hear I hear a lot of people when it comes to healing. Um, I don't have all the answers by any means. Uh, the, the, we just had a, a dear brother in the Lord. I, I was his pastor 25 years ago. He passed away oh, just over a week ago. And Alice and I attended his funeral service uh, this past this past week, beginning of the week. Um, well, no, I know Jesus has raised people from the dead. I don't think he would have wanted to be raised from the dead. And you know what? It says in the Word of God that there's an appointed time for everything. There's a time for every event. And it says that there's a time to be born, there's a time to die. If this was not true, then we'd have a world full of thousand year old, two thousand year old Christians running around. You know? But that, that's not dead. Because that perfect healing is to go to be with the Lord. Right. I mean, there are things that are not the same. But I, I do know this. Mm -hmm. Jesus wants you to have the fullness of life. And God does miraculous healings. Yes, he does. You know, and he always does them with his word. So get into his word and study that. All right. So Paul goes on to say in verse 14, For you, brethren, became imitators of the church of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hands of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men, hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. But wrath has come upon them to the utmost. So Paul is talking about, you know, he's saying to the Thessalonians, of Thessalonians, you know, that they remember this started well in persecution, and remember, Paul came to them because of persecution in Philippi, right? So he's saying that they're imitating the people that have gone before them in, in Judea because remember, they're being persecuted there for the faith, they're being beaten, they're being imprisoned, right? So he's saying that they're imitators. Now, we're not supposed to be imitators so much of the church as encouraged by 
what we see others do. What are we supposed to be? Jesus. Yeah, what did Paul say? Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children in Ephesians 5.1. We have a great cloud of witnesses, as Hebrews 12.1 says, who have gone on before us to give us an example. Paul himself said, be imitators of me, just as I am also of Christ. Mm -hmm. So we're supposed to use that example of what others have done as an encouragement. This is why it says, that, you know, the saints in Revelation talks about how they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. The word of their testimony is an example of what others have done to be an encouragement to us. Not an encouragement about so much about their faith, although that's, that's a nice thing. You know, I wrote a book called The Master's Call. It's about when, as a matter of fact, the three of us were down in uh, Central America. We were living down there as missionaries and just going down there. And I was hit by a speeding semi-truck. Uh, and I wrote this book finally called The Master's Call. And it's the account of how I miraculously survived getting, I was on foot. I got hit by a speeding semi-truck. And I didn't write that to receive any glory. I, one of the reasons that I didn't write it for so long was I didn't want you know, I'm not looking to focus anybody's attention on me. But I finally wrote it, and I think I wrote it well and properly, because it, it's not about what God did for me as much as it is what God yes. wants to do for you. You know, because he's no respecter of man. He didn't do something special for me that he's not going to do for you. Well, in Revelation, it says, by the word of their testimony. I just said that, yeah. And yeah. Each, each person has something that God showed them and that's part of their testimony. Right. But it's something that God has done in their lives, is that, that testimony. Everybody, every Christian should have a testimony. That's a fact. That's a fact. If, you know, if, if Christ has saved you, you got a testimony. I mean, because he's raised you from the dead. You were dead walking in your transgressions. I mean, we don't often act like that, and we're not living like that, but this is the truth. I mean, you have a great and fantastic testimony just by the fact that you were saved by the shed blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. I think that most Christians miss testimonies because they're looking for this great big miracle or something, and it's with little things that God does every day. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's more than just the revelation. Yeah. A testimony is something that God has yeah. done for you. Right. A testimony is about the mercy and grace of God that's been poured out in your life. And how and much so, He cares for you. Yes. I mean, it's just the smallest yeah. things in your life. That he cares about. I mean, you use that word, and there's a simple verse that says, Cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. Yes. Most people don't cast their cares upon the Lord. No. Because they don't recognize the fullness of that other part of the verse, that he cares for you. Yes. Yes. And that nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. And that no promise that he has ever made has failed to come to pass. So, I, you know, if, if you understand this, if you understand, I mean, and, you know, we've done this before. I'll do it one more time. I have a homework assignment this week. Your homework assignment is to read the 43rd chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. That you are precious in his sight. And he demonstrates the fact that you're... It's not just that he says this. He demonstrates it. He says, you know, you, know, you walk through the sea, you'll not, be, you'll not be drowned. You walk through the fire, you'll not be scorched or burned. Why? Because you're precious in his sight. And you'll make a way. He parted the waters to get him through the Red Sea. He got into the fire, into the furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Whatever it takes, God will be with you, and you'll have a testimony, because nothing is impossible with God. But the fact of the matter is, that testimony is not about you and your faith. That testimony about is about God. the magnificence, the wonderfulness, the awesomeness of God. And how he cares for you. And how he cares for you. And he does. He does. He does. Well, I mean, this is... This is, this is the basis of, you know, we've been talking for weeks now about Paul's ministry. And that's what this whole account is in the beginning of Thessalonians, about the ministry of Paul. His entire ministry is based on one thing. He understood the love of God. He said he knew that nothing could separate him from the love of God. He knew that if God was for him, who could be against him? I mean, this is what empowered him, was this knowledge. And Paul had a testimony. And by the way... One of the reasons a lot of people don't have testimonies is because, they're, they're, you know, you sit on your couch and watch your telly all the time. You'll never have a testimony. It's when you go out and begin to live this walk with Jesus Christ that things begin to happen. Now, some people call them problems. I call them adventures. 
is because when it says many of the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers us from them all. It's when the Lord delivers you from that affliction that now you have a testimony. I've heard, you know, people quip and say, no test, no testimony. Come alone. Yeah. So, I mean, I pray that God is doing things in your life that you can go out and share that will glorify him. Because over and over and over, he does things for that purpose. He gave sight to the blind man in John chapter 9. Why? So that the works of God might be displayed in him. He brought Lazarus out of the tomb. Why? So that he would be glorified. I mean, God wants to do things in your life. Because, yes, he wants to bless you, but he wants the works of God to be displayed in you. He wants, he wants God the Father to be glorified in your life by doing these things that the world can't do. By delivering you, by caring for you in a very visible, outward way. Nothing is a coincidence. No, there's not. A, there's not a coincidence, right? Okay. So let me just get back to this here. You know, we're going to have to kind of end on this. I, I want to, and this is where we'll pick it up next week, talking about in this verse that Paul is talking about the Jews here, and it, this sounds very, very harsh. I mean. Um, how, how the Jews, listen, said they did, the people back in Judea, the Christians, they suffered at the hands of the Jews who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us, talking talk about Paul, drove us out. They're not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men. If you get the idea from this, and this is what I want to talk about next week, that Paul had something against the Jews. He had something against the Judaizers. He had something against those people who were anti the gospel and tried to prevent the gospel. Mm -hmm. But Paul said the most incredible thing that I doubt very few people would have said, and honestly from their heart, he would have given up his salvation for the Jews. Amazing. And it, it still is true today, and I, I'll share a little bit about that when we come back on our next session. But this is still true today, and a lot of people don't understand. As a matter of fact, not, not even thinking about this this morning on Bible Talk, on the front page of Bible Talk, and it's still there at the moment. It may not be there when you see this or after you see this. Uh, we were supposed to go on our recent trip. We were supposed to go to Pakistan, and God closed that door. Yes. The devil tried to thwart it. God used it to close that door to send us someplace. And I'm going to just tell you the way it was. That one night, the Lord woke me up and said, are you willing to go someplace where they're less receptive to the gospel than Pakistan? And I said, yes. He said, Israel. Israel loves Christians. Loves Christians to come in and be tourists and help and boost their economy. But Israel today is no friend of the gospel of Jesus Christ still, just like it was 2,000 years ago. But you want to know something? Don't think harshly. No. Well, because we're going to talk about this next week, and I'm going to show you God's program for that. Paul had a love for, for the Jews. He wasn't so loving towards those who were enemies of the gospel, but he had a love for the Jews, even those who had a veil over their eyes. So we're going to talk about that next week right here. Okay? Okay. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who is the word, the word made flesh who dwelt among us. And, and I pray, Lord God, that we just be seeking that work that you're doing in our lives by your word that you're cutting away the things out of our life with your word that are not you. Cutting away those things, Lord God, that block us from the fullness of life in you. All of those things that are still the world in us, still us in us. Lord, make us more like your son, Christ Jesus. That's the desire of our heart. Change our hearts, O Lord, that we would be more like you. We just praise you and thank you, Father in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. So make sure you're back here again in our next episode of First Thessalonians. God bless you and good night. Your word is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Your word is a light into my path. Here's a lamp into my feet Help me